My shoulders, knees and toes, my bones Good morning to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, good afternoon, Europe and Africa. And good evening goes to Asia Pacific. My name is Christoph Elser from the Arthrex Orthobiologics team based at the EMEA head office in Munich. It's a real pleasure uh, to welcome everybody to today's webinar, Cartilage Regeneration on Minced Cartilage Repair. Uh, according to the ICRS information, we have about 350 participants coming from 50 different countries. A special welcome goes to our two guest speakers today, Professor Max Britberg and Professor Gian Salzman. No need to introduce uh, Professor Britberg since his publication in the New, G New England Journal of Medicine 1994, he, when he together with Lars Peterson introduced the autologist chondrocytes implantation technique, followed by more than 100 uh, publications after this groundbreaking paper. Uh, he, this makes him one of the most respected experts worldwide. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christoph, for this uh, introduction. And I say uh, welcome to all uh, uh, participants in this webinar. We are very happy to have a webinar in these days of COVID-19. Uh, it's good to be able to present and to discuss via internet, but hopefully in the future that we will soon be able to meet in reality. In this session today, we will talk about how to use cartilage fragment for cartilage repair. And uh, I will start to discuss a little about the different formats of chondrocyte that can be in use, and we will turn up with the fragments. Then, uh, Matt, can I introduce uh, Tian for a moment? Yes. Oh, I'm next, sorry. Well, next to him, we have also Professor Salzman, who also focusing on this area since 20 years. Uh, he discovered early on the regenerative potential of minced cartilage when used for cartilage repair procedures. Based on preclinical results collected by other research teams and initial promising clinical results, he started to treat patients about seven years ago at a higher volume using minced cartilage. Given his experience, he is viewed as a pioneer with respect to minced cartilage. Also, welcome, Gian. Hi, everybody. With, uh, I finish with some housekeeping rules. Please mute your phones, switch off your camera, and we encourage everybody to ask questions in the Q&A section on the lower left. With that said, uh, enjoy the webinar, the ICRS webinar, and now again over to you, Matt. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Christoph. Uh, so we will talk about chondrocytes first, and then uh, Christoph uh, Elser will give us information about how to uh, uh, to uh, be able to to use the fragments in a good way for cartilage repair, the different products uh, usable uh, for easy harvesting, etc. And then finally, uh, Gian uh, uh, Salzman will give you uh, uh, information about operative uh, techniques and the tips and tricks that could be useful uh, for a successful repair. And then I will start uh, to talk a little about the chondrocytes. Okay, so. Uh, Many people today, when we are talking about autologous chondrocyte implantation, talk about ICI as an experimental method. But then you should know that it's more than three decades uh, since we did the first chondrocyte implantation in Gothenburg in October 1987. So we need to go through a little about the history of the chondrocytes and ICI. If we looked upon uh, the cells per se, Moscona brothers in 1952 were the first to isolate cells from different types of tissue. And that information was used then by Audrey Smith, who uh, success, had success to isolate chondrocyte and do chondrocyte in cultures. Then Chesterman and co-workers tried to do cartilage repair with chondrocytes in rabbit cartilage and they transplanted uh, uh, the chondrocyte into the humerus of adult sister rabbits, so it was allogenic. 
They had an, a repair tissue, a good feeling, but they couldn't say it was cartilage. It was then first Professor George Bentley to, together with Greer that transplanted uh, allergenic chondrocytes into tibial plateau defects. And they found that you had uh, more than 50% of the defects filled with the cartilaginous tissue repair. W.T. Green was then the first to show that the chondrocytes transplanted, they were also allergenic chondrocytes, really were respon uh, responsible for the repair. They used a radiographic technique. And a similar study was then done uh, by Lars Peterson uh, together with colleagues at Hospital for Joint Diseases, among them Daniel Grandi, where they, for the first time, used autologous chondrocytes in a rabbit repair. And also in those repairs, they had uh, a successful effect of the chondrocyte in the implantation. Myself joined uh, Lars Peterson uh, in uh, 1986, and then uh, we uh, uh, used chondrocytes for a longer follow-up of one year in rabbits. And we could show that with the chondrocyte contribution, you had a nice repair, uh, contra contrary if you just use periosteum without cells with uh, much poor uh, uh, reach cells. However, the first human autologous chondrocyte implantation was then done in 1987 in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, many uh, uh, different types of generation has passed. This is from the first chondrocyte implantation in 1987, uh, uh, the cultured chondrocytes ready for implantation. At that time, a little more like a, uh, like a creamy substance. These are the four generations that we are uh, seen today. The first generation of ICI are cells in suspension put under a roof of living tissue periosteum. The second generation of ICI are cells also in suspension under a roof of an inert dead biological tissue ecology membrane. The third generation of ICI are cells either grown on a surface, uh, a cell carrier, or in a matrix. Um, like a scaffold, a porous scaffold. And the fourth generation of ICI are different formats of directly isolated chondrocytes, and among them also chondral fragments as part of fourth generation of ICI. With the first generation of ICI, you had a living tissue, the periosteum, and the periosteum had periosteal cells that uh, produce bone, but they, the cells go via endochondral ossification uh, so to speak, a chondral phase until you produce bone. But the most important part of the periosteal cells is that uh, they also produce growth factors to stimulate the chondrocytes. So that's uh, important to remember when you look upon the first generation of ICI. With the first generation of ICI, you could have uh, successful results up to 20 years post-surgery, and that has been reported from different centers. And we also have the possibility to take biopsy at that time in more than 100 patients. And we could see that if you look upon the biopsies and compare it with the normal tissue, where a normal tissue has a maximum score of three, you could see that with chondrocyte implantation, you could achieve quite high scores besides the distribution. And then you should remember the cells are implanted as a suspension. So the distribution is difficult to uh, to regulate. Also then you have the second generation of ICL, which is an inert membrane, a collagen membrane uh, that is uh, used. It's easy to use because you don't need to harvest the periosteum. Here you have it off the shelf and could use it directly. You could treat larger defects and you could also treat bipolar lesion because you have less friction compared to when you're using periosteum. However, with the first generation of ICI and partly also with the second generation of ICI, you have a problem of uh, tissue overgrowth because the periosteum being a living tissue have uh, a tendency for 
an outgrowth of tissue, and then you need to do a tissue uh, trimming, a second surgery. And in my own experience, in our patients, we have around one fifth of the patient, 20% that needs a second surgery. Also with the collagen membrane, even though it's not a living tissue, you can have, have an ingrowth from the surrounding tissue, from synovial tissue, so you could have a degree of hypertrophy. But also the first and second generation of ICI needs an open surgery because you need to do an open surgery to suture the membrane, which is a little negative to have open surgery. Then you have loss of implantation of cells because you could have a leakage. And you could also have an uneven distribution uh, <clears throat> because uh, the cells are influenced by gravity being in, uh, uh, in, a, in a solution. So that's why the third generation appeared on the market. And we could see the third generation as pure, pure uh, scaffold. It could be pure uh, cell carrier, but also it could be scaffold free constructs. And if you looked upon a pure cell carrier, you have the Macy developed by Genzyme and furthermore now by Varicel. The cells are then grown on the surface of the collagen material and the uh, construct is put into the defect, in the, to the cartilage defect with the cells facing the bone. So the cells after being put into place, they are leaving the membrane and migrate into uh, the glue to produce a cartilaginous tissue. And quite fast with, the first, uh, with this third generation of ICI with the cell carrier Macy, the Australian group uh, under the leadership of David Woods that presented a lot of studies, among them long-term studies as these five years follow up, where I could see by MRI that you had all, uh, all, also at five years follow up, a nice feel, feeling and a nice cartilaginous repair tissue. But also with a pure scaffold, a pure uh, uh, porous scaffold like hyaluronic hy 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 acid scaffold, the Makachi group at that time from Bologna also present uh, a lot of studies and uh, as this study, uh, a long-term study where you could see at one year up to seven year, the results are sustained at a high level. But there are also uh, a third generation of ICI which are not needing a scaffold, a scaffold-free uh, construct. And such a scaffold-free construct is uh, uh, the chondrospheres, where you put several chondrospheres with a lot of cells in each sphere uh, to uh, put into the defect where uh, the cells migrate out to fuse and start to produce a cartilaginous tissue. Here also, uh, there are reports on the results. And here is a randomized study by uh, Professor Niemeyer's group, where they could show that you could have uh, a good results compared to microfracturing uh, uh, at two years follow-up. Myself, I've been using hyalograft, uh, the high of 11 uh, scaffold, the porous scaffold, because it's easy to use. You could use it transatoscopic to a very high percentage. You could fold it. You could put it into several layers, depending on the depth of the lesion. And here you have a chondral, osteochondral lesion where you should uh, treat uh, the bony part with bone grafts, which you put in uh, transatoscopic and then several layers of the cell seeded graft. Here you see the bone grafts and you mix it with fibrin glow and then you push it into place and you have the bone in situation in the location. And then you size your cell seeded grafts, the high F11 seeded with the chondrocytes and then put it into place. And these type of grafts are called immature grafts because most of the cells have not started to produce any matrix, but you could see on the top, the bluish color, there are some matrix produced. So that's why we call it an immature graft. And if, if, if you put such a graft uh, into a, a skid mouse after four weeks in vitro culture, you could see at eight weeks after eight weeks in the skid mouse, you have a nice cartilaginous production, which uh, from uh, this graft, which from the start was immature, and now it has been a major uh, development. 
With this type of graft, you could do a lot of transatoscopic procedure, uh, and you could use it also for difficult positions like the patella, as in this picture, and also from here in different uh, uh, um, ways to introduce the graft, uh, not needing open surgery. Well, in the beginning, we talked about ICI being an experimental study in many countries, uh, if still in, in the discussions. But if you look upon 2003 to 2021, uh, there have been 21 RCTs performed, and 16 of them have been against uh, another cartridge repair technology. And in nine of those 16, ICI showed superiority in different parameters studied. And 12 of those studies involve different generation of ICI versus bone marrow stimulation. And ICI was significantly better in different parameters in eight of those 12 studies. And among those RCTs, two were with cartilage fragment, uh, which we will talk more about later. The largest cartilage repair study RCT so far is the summit study by uh, Vericell. Uh, where at two years, at three years, and the five years follow-up, ICI in form of MACI have been significantly better than uh, bone marrow stimulation in, in coos pain and function and in uh, uh, subscales of ADL, quality of life, and other symptoms. However, we have now the fourth generation of ICI, which could be either cartilage fragment as autologous or allogenic, but it could also be a direct isolation of chondrocyte uh, in different formats. One way of isolate chondrocyte directly is to do it directly at the time of operation in the OR with a special machine. You isolate the chondrocytes, but you don't need so much cells at that time. It's not possible to have the, the, the large amount of cells that you see after cell expansion and culture. So then you need to mix them with MSCs and you take the MSCs from the iliac crest. So it's pure uh, autologous in this way. And that has been done in uh, this so-called instruct study. But it's also possible to do a one-stage procedure where you isolate the chondrocytes with their uh, pericellular matrix, so-called chondrons. And those chondrons are then mixed with allogenic MSEs and then put into fibrin glow and injected into the joint uh, via so-called airbrushing technique. The impact study has been uh, using this technology and you will see more reports from both the instruct impact study in the future in, in manuscripts. This is the nice paper uh, and presentation from Hunziger and Rosenberg where they made uh, uh, partial thickness lesion and looked upon the repair possibilities. And they could see that even those uh, defects were repaired, but with cells from the synovial lining. So synovial cells were invading this area to produce a repair. And when they added TGF beta 2, they have an even stronger repair and also some contribution from surrounding cartridge in the defect area. And this is important to remember when we talk now more about cartilage fragment. Because in the top layer of cartilage, Williams and co-workers have shown that there are so-called uh, progenitor chondrocytes. You could say that they, they are the stem cells of cartilage. Those cells are more active, they have better migration capacity and a stronger repair response. And Marmotti and, and co-workers in Italy have shown that these type of cells also show an age-dependent and time-dependent uh, uh, migration. So young patients have more efficient cells. And also when you look upon the time to have a production from such cells, it takes at least two months uh, before you get uh, a, a nice cartilaginous tissue. Uh, then you have uh, uh, the, the, uh, the company um, Dupuis, uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, MyTech, that developed the KAIS technology, the cartilage autograph implantation system, 
where you, with a special machine, harvest small fragments of cartilage, put them on a PDS uh, material, and then implant it into the defect and fixate it with staples. And this uh, study, the CHI study, has been looked upon in two randomized studies, one in America and one in Europe. And both studies have shown that you have uh, the possibility to get a better repair with fragment compared to micro uh, fracturing regarding AKDC and COOS at uh, two years follow up. So that was a stimulating uh, finding. Uh, then uh, Bonasi and co workers looked upon the size of the fragment and could show that you need at least. Uh, um, uh, you, you, uh, you shouldn't have a larger uh, fragments than um, uh, 0.3 millimeters, which makes it out like a chondral paste. Then you have more effective uh, uh, migration from the fragment. And my colleague Sebastian Concaro, in his thesis, could show that for fragments, you have a very nice outcome of a new tissue. You see the pink colored tissue is the outgrowth from the fragment, which you could see has a similarity to the bluish color, the native uh, cartilage from the fragment. And we should give some congratulations to Sebastian celebrating his 50 years of age yesterday. Well, then uh, uh, today's sponsor, Artrex, has uh, been working uh, to produce uh, instrumentation to better harvest and to get good quality fragment out of, uh, of a harvest. And uh, you could combine these fragments with different types of, of uh, boosting effects like using allogenic cartilage, like biocartilage, and also adding PRP. And we will hear more about it from Christoph and Gian. Myself, I became interested in using fragment when I took part in the CHI study but the, the CHI study, the company didn't uh, continue to develop their instrumentation. So I have used a, a modified CHI, so-called cartilage fragment implantation membrane augmented technique, where you have a defect in the cartilage, you debride the lesion, you put fibrin glue in the bottom of the lesion, and then I'm using the Artrex graft net collector, which is very useful uh, to be coupled to your uh, to your shaver system, and you could uh, use a shaver so you get this very small fragment out like a paste, and you could see on the right picture the paste that had been produced from the shaving. And then you put this paste into your into your syringe uh, and uh, push it into the glue. And in small defects, it's enough to have the fibrin glue together with the fragment. If you have a larger defect, and if you have a deep defect, you may need to use a scaffold and you could add like hyalophast, the hyaluronic acid scaffold, which is the same material as I'm using when I'm using cultured chondrocytes. Then it's also possible to use allogenic fragments and then you could have it off the shelf. And as you heard, you could even mix allogenic juvenile fragment together with the patient's autologous fragment to have a boosting effect for the repair. ICI, chondrocyte implantation, 34 years after the first operation, we could still say that cartilage repair is a problem and we need to be better. Uh, you know, this old citation from William Hunter in 1743 that cartilage is a troublesome tissue. Uh, 60 years has passed and we did the first uh, microfracting technique, the subchondral drilling with Predi technique. Uh, and now we are in the fourth generation of ICI with different versions. All of us want to produce as much of a hyaline like repair tissue as possible. And when we look upon a cartilage repair, most often we look upon the collagen type two versus the collagen type one ratio to see how good our technique is. But there's also a possibility to use what's called um, DNA methylation landscape uh, to look upon the quality of the repair. And Boomer and co-workers, they actually used chondrocytes to, to make cartilage repair in, a, in an animal model, and then they used 
bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells. And the primary chondrocytes, they exhibited a DNA methylation landscape almost identical to the surrounding normal cartilage, which was totally in contrast to the repatties you produced from the MSCs. So you'll see the importance using chondrocytes. And then also important to remember is that a mixture of chondrocytes that you're using for chondrocyte implantation outperform mesenchymal stem cells in chondrogenic ability. Young chondrocytes outperform old chondrocytes. And these uh, special uh, cartilage tissue progenitor cells in the top layer of cartilage, those that you could think about migrating out from the fragment, they outperform committed chondrocytes. So finally, I would say I still in 2021 uh, uh, prefer uh, the true human chondrocytes in comparison to MSCs in different formats, in vitro expanded, directly isolated, or from cartilage fragments. So do not forget that articular chondrocytes alone as cells are responsible for the very unique features of articular cartilage. And therefore, it seems rational to use true committed chondrocytes in different formats to repair a cartilaginous defects. And I thank you very much for your kind attention and give my words to Christoph Elser. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, for this fantastic presentation and this overview regarding the uh, use of chondrocytes within the historical background. Uh, I'm, not, I'm now more than happy uh, to present and to pave the way in to the AutoCAD part of the session by providing uh, some AutoCAD basics, AutoCAD all autologous cartilage regeneration. When we talk about uh, tissue regeneration, tissue healing, our philosophy follows the well-described in the literature, uh, the so-called healing trinity or the healing triad. Uh, whereas uh, the hypothesis is that you, that you need three essential cornerstones to allow a high quality tissue regeneration. You need an appropriate level of growth factors. You need uh, regenerative cells fitting uh, to the type of the tissue. And finally, you need a scaffold or matrix where the cell can, can grow in. This is true for all of our autobiologics products where we try to substitute these cornerstones in case they are missing. Uh, as best as possible and as close to the nature as possible. In case of the AutoCAD all autologous cartilage regeneration, we need to provide all three cornerstones given the absence in the cartilage lesion. Uh, you can see my presentation. You can see it now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so in the, in the case of cartilage regeneration, we need to provide all three cornerstones uh, given the absence in the cartilage lesion. So first of all, uh, the, the growth factors. Uh, here, obviously, we are using uh, platelet-rich plasma therapies, PRP therapies to offer uh, the missing growth factors. And here, uh, here the, the origin of the growth factors are uh, obviously in the alpha granules contained in the platelet itself. On the right hand side, you can see an unactivated uh, platelet, which then by activation change uh, the shape into a more dendritic shape, re releasing the growth factors. How do we get the PRP? Uh, we actually uh, simply use physics and using the distribution of the mass density uh, of the different cell types. And by given a, dip, a specific uh, spinning protocol, we then can differentiate, we then can separate the platelets from the rest uh, of the cells. Uh, for that, we use our ACP double syringe, which, con which consists on a bigger outer syringe where the blood is withdrawn, and then the plasma after centrifugation can be transferred into the smaller inner syringe uh, by not uh, opening. So this is a closed system. Uh, when we, where we can offer a safe and effective way. The way we do it, we, we withdraw 15 ml uh, of peripheral blood into the outer syringe, 
and then put the syringe into a centrifuge, uh, spin that for five minutes at 1500 rounds per minute, what we call a soft spin, giving, giving us a plasma-based uh, PRP. You see the yellow face on top is then containing the platelets, is then transferred into the small syringe without any opening, counterclockwise turning, and then you are ready uh, for injection here. And in our case, when we use that intraoperatively, this produced uh, ACP is then transferred into the sterile field by either using a female female connector or a three-way stopcock. Finally, we get in our cocktail a two to three-fold increased platelet concentration. And at the same time, we reduce the white blood cells, specifically the neutrophils, by about 80%. And we do that on purpose. Uh, we, could do, we could do it differently and, and leave the other cells, the white blood cells in, but we know from the literature and our philosophy is for tissue regeneration processes, we prefer to have all the neutrophils or most of the neutrophils removed and not adding additional inflammation into an already inflamed area. Uh, there are nice descriptions of uh, the, the role of growth factors and their function with regards to cartilage regeneration. One example here uh, published by Lisa Fortier uh, clearly shows the positive, the beneficial effects of the different growth factors when used in combination with cartilage regeneration or chondrocyte transplantation. In summary, uh, we can see an upregulation uh, of many different cell types, chondrocyte proliferation, proteoglycan production, type 2 collagen production, all of these are upregulated. Uh, even the compressive mechanical properties are increased and the superficial foam protein production also is upregulated. Up and again, at the same time, we downregulate with the concentrated growth factors, the inflammation uh, in the respective tissue. Next in line, the regenerative cells. And here, when we talk about cartilage regeneration, we obviously talk about chondrocytes. And here, again, we talk about uh, patient's own cartilage again, uh, that we are here using in that type for cartilage regeneration. Here, as uh, uh, Max already said, this is not new, the idea of using cartilage particulates uh, already uh, described in 1983 by Albrecht and his team in a small animal model uh, where they used cartilage chips where the untreated group and they saw good cell proliferation, highly like cartilage repair, and an extracellular matrix evident in the chips group. Uh, confirmed in 2006 by Liu et al. Uh, in a large animal model, also finding uh, good results and concluding this is a simple, cost-effective, and safe treatment. Uh, Max uh, mentioned the CHI study performed by Depuy Mitech with the product, uh, did, but the product did not make it uh, to the market. Uh, independent of that, uh, Christensen and his team in, in, in Aarhus then started to treat uh, patients clinically. Uh, uh, 2015, they treated eight patients uh, with OCD, uh, transplanting autologous bone and cartilage chips, uh, and they saw very good restoration and good cartilage repair. Then Gian uh, did a, a higher volume series with 27 patients with excellent results uh, at follow up, in, improved function, and decreased pain. But when we started to talk to Professor Salzman, we obviously discovered that this procedure, uh, cutting the chips manually on the back table in the operating room, is very time consuming, cumbersome, uh, and not very uh, standard, standardized. So our challenge was we want to do that in an easy, uh, easy, easy way, quickly, and of course, standardized. We extensively test, intensively tested different uh, cutting methods uh, in the lab. And in the end, uh, we found uh, some limitations uh, by these cutting procedures one way or the other, either not uh, very standardized or the viability of the chondrocytes were not uh, to our satisfaction. So we continued to then evaluate uh, our different shaver types in our portfolio and finally ended up with five different uh, shavers we uh, uh, tested uh, in very much detail, specifically focusing on chondrocytes viability and also uh, standardization and uh, reproducibility. And in the end, our uh, three millimeter stable shaver uh, was our shaver of choice. He nicely produced reproducible small particles with uh, uh, cell viability, chondrocytes viability, uh, north of 80% in all the tests we did. Uh, so a quick words on the 
cell counting because these are questions we are getting frequently particle size, as I said, one by one by one millimeter approximately. And when we uh, look at the paper published by Hunziger uh, uh, saying that each particle uh, approximately contains about 10,000 chondrocytes per cubic millimeters, uh, we then obviously need to, when we want to transplant uh, 1 million cells per volume unit, we need to transplant 100 particles, assuming, of, uh, however, a packing density of one, which is unrealistic uh, in reality. So when we adjusted uh, these calculations to reality and assumed a cell viability of 80% and a packing density uh, of 0.8, uh, we calculated that we need to transplant 170, around 170 particles per volume unit, which we achieved in every test we did. Now that we have, collect, now that we have selected the appropriate harvesting site, uh, next in line, then we need a, a device to actually collect the harvested particulate, uh, cartilage particulates. And here we use our Grafnet autologous tissue collector. Uh, the tissue collector uh, is uh, put between the shaver handpiece and the suction tubing. Uh, then you start to harvest the cartilage chips and collect, it, collect them in the collector. And then if, when you are done with that, you can actually disconnect the graft net again. You can open the graft net and there's a little plunger inside, which then can be removed. And then you have an easy access to the harvested chips. Uh, these chips then are transferred into a small bowl and uh, mixed with a few drops of ACP, which has two effects. First of all, the cartilage chips becomes pasty. So, so they are very easy for applying. But the other reason for doing that, we start now to add uh, fibrillogen containing the ACP, which is important when we talk later on about the fixation. So this cartilage paste then is transferred into the application cannula, which uh, then can be, the paste can be then advanced with the uh, drocar to the tip of the cannula. And then you can start to apply the cartilage paste into the lesion. Uh, and then you do that, you can turn around the cannula and shape uh, the uh, applied paste uh, uh, until you are satisfied, shown on the right hand side. So, these are the chips. And finally, what we need is the matrix. And, and you may remember when we use cartilage particulates, we already have peri-cellular uh, uh, matrix and also extracellular matrix surrounding the chondrocytes. But now we are adding an additional matrix uh, by using our uh, thrombinator device producing autologous thrombin solution which uh, actually also uh, is needed for the clot formation and finally the particulate fixation in the lesion. What do we do here? Uh, we use our thrombinator device, which is preloaded with so-called borosilicate spheres in different sizes and different shapes. So what we do here, uh, these uh, borosilicate spheres lead to the activation of the, co of the coagulation cascade, mimicking uh, a damaged surface. So what we do here uh, in practice, we add three milliliter of ACP to the, to the device. And by doing that, we activate factor 12 by the ne negatively charged borosilicate spheres. And this in turn then produces what we call the prothrombinase complex. The prothrombinase complex is essential and necessary for uh, producing uh, the thrombin in the second step. The good news here is this first step, producing the prothrombinase complex is not time critical. So this, this complex remains active for about four hours. Therefore, we recommend to start with the production of the autologous thrombin right after you confirm uh, an autocard indication arthroscopically at the beginning of the procedure. Uh, even if you uh, are uh, delayed in your procedure, uh, if you're facing some complications, so there is no rush, no time pressure, this first step remains uh, stable for about four hours. So you have all the time to harvest the chips, to mix the chips with the ACP, and even apply the chips into the lesion uh, until you are satisfied. Only then you start the next step, uh, what we call the production, where you actually produce uh, the thrombin out of the prothrombin uh, present in the biologic fluid uh, ACP. By doing that, we add another six ml of ACP to the device. We shake it again and allow the clot just to sit for one more minute. The, the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin is a pretty quick process and only needs, as I said, one more minute. Then we can add the uh, filter, which comes with the device to make sure uh, no borosilicate spheres are 
uh, with thrombin within your thrombin, and then you are good to go with your autologous thrombin. When we uh, remember, we have already applied the cartilage chips into the lesion containing some uh, fibrinogen in the ACP. When we now adding the produced autologous thrombin solution to the cartilage paste uh, inside the lesion, we already start uh, the coagulation <coughs> of the fibrin. So you see here on the left hand side, we applied some drops of thrombin uh, to the cartilage paste, uh, actually kicking off the fixation and the gluing process. Uh, to, uh, to finally seal and fix the construct, we use again a mix of ACP containing fibrinogen and the produced thrombin one-to-one -one ratio. We mix that outside, actually producing platelet-rich fibrin. And then we add this additional layer on top uh, of the cartilage paste to really finally seal uh, this construct. Uh, we get questions sometimes about the strength uh, compared to commercially available fiber sealants. And uh, the group of Lawrence and Lisa, uh, Brian Cole, uh, they did a nice uh, study here using uh, the model Buckley uh, developed in 2008 to 2010, uh, talking about microstress, microforces on cartilage itself. We, they applied this model to both uh, commercially fibrin sealant, in that case Tissil, and also autologous thrombin produced with our thrombinator and some blood components. And what they concluded in their, in their, in their uh, paper that the all allogenic means commercially available sealant and the all autologous sealant provides mechanically, mechanically similar graft adhesion to the articular cartilage. Furthermore, the autologous components, however, contain lower fibrinogen and thrombin concentrations compared to the commercially available source. But this, without compromising the mechanical uh, strength, leads to a much more open uh, structure of the clot, allowing uh, the cells to migrate fairly easily. So overall, the conclusion uh, demonstrated that without compromising uh, the mechanical uh, uh, benefits and the features of the autologous uh, cartilage, uh, uh, fibrin sealant, sorry, uh, the, we can also uh, result in the similar uh, way of the fibrin performance of the fibrin sealant. With that said, I summarize the autocar procedure. Uh, we are using uh, several products out of our portfolio, the Sabre uh, three millimeter shaver, the GraphNet tissue collector, the Arthrex ACP containing the fibrinogen and the growth factors and the thrombinator with the autologous uh, thrombin. We can offer a safe uh, procedure because it's all autologous, no synthetics, uh, no foreign materials. It's a fast one-step procedure in the operating room. And as I said at the beginning, we uh, provide an optimized healing environment by offering all three cornerstones, which we believe are necessary for high quality tissue and cartilage regeneration. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Gian. Yes, Chris. Uh, hi, also again from my side, uh, again, it is really an honor to speak in front uh, uh, of the whole world, uh, more than 50 countries, that is, that is uh, really, really uh, great. And uh, thank you, uh, Arthrex, for the invitation. Thank you, Mats, for the uh, great uh, talk. You know, I admire you and uh, it was really nice to have been visiting you. Uh, more than uh, 10 years ago in, in Gothenburg, that was really uh, great. And uh, thank you, Chris, for your uh, great uh, talk, for also giving some introduction to uh, my talk. As you now heard already, when you are treating cartilage, your clear goal is to have the highest possible regenerate quality within your defect site. And this is clear to histologic meta-analysis studies the more higher line the cartilage you are generating, the better is the clinical outcome and the better is the return to sport. And mostly cartilage patients are young subjects with a goal to return to sport, even if it is low level soccer, tennis, etc. The matter of biologic potency becomes even more important when you are treating problematic cartilage lesions. Problematic cartilage lesions are to my consideration 
any osteochondral lesions because reconstituting the subchondral plate is not always easy. How to do your cancerous bone plasty? Do you do it arthroscopic or open? I think anything, um, a large chondral, purely chondral lesions with malonite knee joints, unstable knee joints, etc., are problematic lesions starting at four and even larger square centimeters. And everything at the knee cap uh, is problematic to my consideration because the patellofemoral joint is often unstable, malaligned, and it has very thick cartilage, and you need a high potential to uh, actually build um, that um, up. Uh, as Mats reported, and I'm still um, considering that, I think the best way to treat cartilage lesions is by using uh, chondrocytes. And if you look at um, uh, compelling meta-analysis uh, studies, I think it is getting interesting at five and 10 years, uh, the best long-term data are still generated uh, by autologous chondrocyte implantation at five and uh, 10 years and clearly outperforming all concurring procedures that are microfracturing, where it is now pretty well uh, known and reported that results are going down after three to five years and that is clearly lesion size limited. And for osteochondral plaque transplantation, I think you have also a very clear disadvantage with regard to size and they are uh, initially meant to treat osteochondral lesions and most lesions are purely chondral. It's a different story when you can, uh, this is the case for uh, US Americans, etc. If you have a good availability for fresh osteochondral aircraft, that's uh, actually um, a very good alternative. It is not uh, off the shelf available so easy across uh, Europe, but I think that's a very good uh, alternative. Uh, in the last years, uh, AMIC has been uh, coming up where you perform a microfracturing and then uh, put a membrane on top, you glue it, you suture it, uh, etc. You can also do that uh, arthroscopic, but to my consideration, you do not much different than microfracturing, but you put a membrane on, but I think the biologic potential of the AMIC procedure is not as strong as when you're using autologous or allergenic chondrocytes, even though um, the evidence is getting stronger, but I think we need some more evidence to really support the AMIC procedure. And to my consideration, the biologic potential of chondrocytes is a larger. So still, and this is according to uh, evidence, um, chondrocyte implantation is still the gold uh, standard, yet it seems also to be limited. So not every patient is perfect after autologous chondrocyte implantation, which is, uh, which is uh, normal furthermore. And I think this is one clear disadvantage is with ACI that the cells are sitting in the lab for four, six, eight weeks, and you see some de-differentiation, maybe some senescence, some uh, getting older of the cells. I don't think this is perfect for the chondrocytes. I think they will get it back in humans, but this is some disadvantage of the procedure. But what is clearly a disadvantage of the procedure in current times, it is a two-stage procedure. You always need two operations. In Europe, uh, especially in Germany and Switzerland, it is highly regulated. And in the uh, later generations, it is pretty costly. And not every insurance company and not every hospital is uh, covering for the cost anymore, even though you have a young patient, traumatic lesion, and clear indication. And furthermore, sorry, Mats, uh, the technique is now getting in years, and I think we need some modification. And with regard to the biologic potency, which is very well reported in the literature, when you're looking at in vitro data, at uh, animal studies, I think the biologic potency for treating cartilage defects by using minced cartilage by, by using chondrons is very, very high. Much closely looking at that, and this is a publication uh, published in 2004 by Charlie Archer and group, what happens when you mince, when you cut, when you particulate cartilage, you activate it. So uh, you in induce a trauma to the cartilage and the cartilage is able to react, but just a little bit. This is why small lesions are easily covered up by new cartilage, but not larger lesions. But when you mince cartilage and put a lot of chondrons at the defect, side, I think this is working. And 
Charlie Archer nicely showed when you cut cartilage reactivated and you see more proliferation of the chondrocytes. And when you have a sharp instrument, you don't um, uh, induce too much necrosis and apoptosis. At the same time, uh, besides proliferation, you induce extracellular matrix production so the cells are not dividing, uh, um, but they are also putting down more matrix in order to fill out uh, the lesion. And those two ways are working perfectly together to fill up uh, existing cartilage lesions. And going back now 11, uh, 12 years, David Frisbee already compared in six horses using the KAIS, as Mats already reported, directly comparing KAIS the chips to a typical ACI procedure and he saw in histologic sections that there was absolutely no difference between uh, the ACI and the KAIS uh, uh, subjects, clearly showing already uh, the high uh, biologic potential of cartilage chips in a very translational horse model. We uh, questioned ourselves uh, last year with a multi-center study, which was published yes, last year, where do we get the cartilage uh, from? And uh, we compared cartilage from the defect edge to the periphery of the defect. And what we found out that the cartilage quality, which is very clear, is not as good in the periphery uh, and not as good in the center when you di directly compare it to the periphery, which is clear, but the cellularity, cell viability, proliferation rate was the same, but uh, um, typical extracellular matrix production was much better in the periphery. And since then, uh, my, um, uh, my um, um, best biopsy site for my uh, minced cartilage procedure is actually the defect edge because you have a very good cartilage quality you create stable vital rims and this is also very important you have location specific cartilage so if you're transplanting a patella uh, cartilage defect where you need a very specific cells very high biologic potential you treat that with patella uh, chondrocytes and not something coming from a non-weight bearing region so if I have a good traumatic lesion with a pure chondral delamination, typical uh, first time patella luxation, knee dislocation, um, um, strong ACL trauma, etc., I actually take that cartilage for my transplantation. If I have degenerative lesions, I take good looking pieces from the defect itself and mostly from the defect edge. Usually you can gather more uh, than enough more than enough. And we showed in our own study at ETH in Zurich uh, that the cartilage is vital and it stays vital even in vitro over four weeks. And as Mats already uh, showed, it shows a potent outgrowth. So the, the chondrocytes are coming out of the chips. They are vital to establish new matrix to fill out the lesion. And the advantage of that is furthermore, that you are not transplanting naked chondrocytes, but you are transplanting chondrocytes that are still surrounded by some matrix, which is called paracellular matrix, the PCM, so the matrix directly adjacent to the chondrocytes. And many, many very important things to the chondrocytes are happening at this uh, PCM. And this is why many studies uh, that are directly comparing naked chondrocytes to chondrons are reporting a better a chondrogenic potential of the chondron when directly comparing to chondrocytes. This is how we started, as Chris reported seven years ago in Zurich, mincing by hand, open procedure. Uh, this worked very well, but was very time consuming. And this is one problem. The other problem is that uh, even after 25 minutes of mincing by hand, every time changing the knife, you have more a block-like appearance, which is not good for transplantation, which is not good for arthroscopic transplantation. This is one problem. The other problem, Bonasia and colleagues in their study reported that you want to have a paste-like appearance because the surface is larger, outgrowth of the cells is much better, and you have a better ECM production. So we want to have a paste-like appearance of your, uh, of your chips. Nevertheless, we reported our first 27 patients at that time, 2019, with a still a very good uh, outcome. We covered that with a chondrogenic uh, membrane um, from Geistlich, which worked very well, uh, but still it is an open uh, procedure. Um, we will report the five-year data soon. The results are stable so far. At the same time, from Madrid, 
Ramon Cugat um, reported about his technique, mini open chips uh, that were uh, mixed with ACP as a membrane, which worked also uh, very well. But we changed that uh, with the way of the AutoCAD procedure, all arthroscopic approach. We have the deep righted lesion, and then we come in with a 3.0 soft tissue shaver device and take a vital cartilage from the defect edge, which uh, directly is uh, gathered with a shaver and collected in the graft net and the shaver is mincing, mincing it directly without harming proliferation or vitality. And then you can easily monitor how much cartilage you have gathered. And the next step, it is mixed with the ACP. And you can see here as Bonasia uh, recommended when you mix the chips with ACP, you have a paste-like appearance, which is very good and perfectly um, uh, available for transplantation. And the good thing about the ACP, it is good for chondrogenic proliferation differentiation, but is also controlling inflammation at the site of the defect, but at the whole joint. And this is what I see in my patients, in my early patients, six, 12 weeks after the autocard procedure, not much infusion, not much swelling, not much pain. So the early, early results are very good. This is related to a purely autologous approach, I think, arthroscopic approach, but also to the controlling inflammation of um, the ACP. But furthermore, uh, according to more current evidence, ACP is also uh, beneficial for coagulation. So you see less bleeding, which is good for the joint. For, furthermore, it has been reported that ACP is attracting stem cells from the synovia. So you will have some stem cells attracted from the synovia, which is very rich in stem cells, which are, uh, are pulled to the chips and they work nicely together as uh, Mats already reported uh, for chondrogenic differentiation. And finally, uh, it is also anti-infective uh, because of the leukocytes, even if it's poor in leukocytes, because you have an anti-infective um, uh, aspect, which is good to, uh, to prevent uh, infection so far. I have no infection in my AutoCAD um, uh, procedure. This is how it looks like, a uh, purely arthroscopic approach, medial condyle. You have your special application cannula. The chips are mixed with ACP, and then it is very easy to apply the chips across uh, the defect, and the ACP is working as your cell carrier to my consideration. You don't need a membrane anymore, and according to most current evidence, I don't think membranes are really needed uh, besides special indications I will show later on for cartilage repair because with regard to the very strong fibrin, the stability for the chips is there. The cells want to be alone, the chondrocytes want to be alone to start early on the regeneration uh, process. And I don't think um, a chondrogenic potential of the membrane is uh, needed. So cells only is my approach. And this is also reported in ACI products. This is a paper on chondrospheres, which are also working without a membrane, building up their own matrix. But according to more current evidence, which I showed before, uh, the chondrons at time of transplantation do not have too much actually matrix. Just one um, example for you don't need a membrane. This is a young lady suffering from a cartilage lesion at her kneecap, problematic lesion, you need a lot of biologic potential. In that case, I did it open because it is more easy to approach at the kneecap because you don't have to go upwards all the time. This was almost six square centimeter. Uh, six square centimeters I performed the typical autocard uh, procedure. No membrane, only purely uh, autologous fibrin. And you see at a five months MRI, no pain, very good reconstitution, no delamination uh, of uh, the transplant. But what I think where you still can use membranes is uh, re -re -revision, re revision cases. This young lady has a, a large osteochondral lesion, initially an OD lesion at a medial condyle, many previous operations, I performed a large cancellous bone plasty plus chips on top. And because I had a large construct to repair and a lot of bone integrated, I was not absolutely sure about the stability. And in such cases, I use an autologous membrane. I take some synovial flap 
from the suprapatellar pouch or from the side of atrotomy. You trim it down at the back table. It has many layers. You need some time, but it works actually nicely. Then it is very flexible. You can look uh, through it and then you cut it according to lesion size, put it on your chips. And synovia acts nicely together with chondrocytes and some interrupted sutures. And you could you can actually put some fibrin on top, gives a very good stability. And so far, uh, this works nicely. I've done just six cases or so, but so far the patients are doing fine. So I actually um, um, took it one more step further. Uh, this uh, bipolar starting OA uh, lesion at the patellofemoral joint, yeah. bipolar lesion. Also, as uh, Mats reported, I think if you have two sides kissing bipolar lesions, it is uh, uh, reasonable to cover up one side using a membrane. And still here, I use um, synovial membrane because it is purely autologous and biologically very active. And so far, this patient is also doing uh, pretty um, uh, fine. Other than that, you can trust what is coming out of the thrombinator. As Chris already reported, if, if you do everything correctly, the fibrin is very strong. And as evidently reported, it has the same strength when you directly compare it to allergenic fibrin glue. And you see it at the time of application, it is already coagulating and giving you a very good stability of your construct. And this is how it looks finally, medial condyle, uh, um, uh, small, medium, large uh, lesion. And this is also always my final step of the AutoCAD um, procedure that I perform full flexion extension maneuvers to be sure that there will be no early delamination to test stability of my construct. And finally, to mold in uh, the, the whole lesion a little into the defect to, to have a perfect uh, fit uh, across my defect. So this works nicely. And you can see here no delamination uh, just because of the um, uh, strong adhesive and coagulation capacities of the fibrin. This works nicely. And I don't think you need a membrane and you can uh, be arthroscopic in uh, almost every case. And the good thing about the AutoCAD uh, procedure is that you can uh, also reach um, hard to reach uh, locations such as the tibial plateau. This is a lateral tibial plateau in a valgus deformity. So I performed an arthroscopic uh, AutoCAD procedure at the lateral tibial plateau. You have to push up the outer meniscus a little bit. There you see the swap in the, in the back, but uh, this works also uh, nicely and gives you good stability. And so far also this patient is doing fine. Furthermore, uh, I um, uh, uh, went a little uh, further. This is a young lady who had a, a lesion at a medial condyle easily to apply, but uh, more closely looking, she had two more lesions at, this, at the trochlea, this double eye lesion. So I had, uh, I had some chips left and I uh, performed also here the autocard procedure. So after drying out the knee joint, uh, you can also treat multi locations with that uh, procedure. The good thing about it, is since it is an uh, arthroscopic and not so expensive procedure, it is very easy to combine with what you do typically. So osteotomies, uh, patella stability, patella mile alignment, uh, ACL surgery, meniscus surgery, cancellous bone plasty. It works also uh, very good all in a one uh, step uh, procedure. And as we know, at the patellofemoral joint, you see a lot of instability, mile alignment. And in my hands, 80 to 90% of cases uh, are getting a co-intervention for stabilizing or um, um, aligning uh, the kneecap. And this is just perfect when the, when the cetus is open. Anyhow, you just can put a cartilage in for the benefit of the patient as a one-step procedure. And here, under open uh, circumstances, just the same way, apply the chips, apply the uh, thrombin, apply the fibrin, and then it is stable. You flip back the kneecap and perform your rehabilitation at the same is true for cancellous bone plasty, which I try currently to do also full arthroscopic. This is a lateral uh, trochlea with an OD lesion. And I performed a cancellous bone plasty. In this uh, case, allogenic plus ACP, also very evident. And on top, I performed my uh, AutoCAD um, procedure also with uh, very good results. Still, 
I think the biologic background is the same as ACI. So you have chondrocytes that have to proliferate and build matrix. So you have to give it some time, maturation processes. This is a neurologist who had a cartilage lesion at this medial trochlea. This is how it looks under arthroscopic settings. Minced cartilage procedure, not the best I've done so far. This is the six months. MI, not so good results, still some effusion, not much pain. So we uh, decided just to wait. And at 12 months, this MI looked very good. No effusion, good cartilage reconstitution, not much bone marrow edema. And the neurologist um, did fine, went back uh, to uh, skiing. So you have to respect maturation processes in such cases as well, even though the early rehabilitation is very quick. Just one more case. This is a rheumatologist who came into my clinics with an um, acute on chronic cartilage lesion at this medial condyle. Other than that, the knee joint was great, stable, mal no malalignment, and he was sporting very active. He wanted the surgery. So I performed also here the autocard procedure under arthroscopic settings. You can see here some alpha fat pad is involved in the chips, which I do on purpose because of the stem cells. So far, I see very good results. And as you know, um, um, rheumatologists are always a little anxious. So he performed an MRI uh, three months already after the procedure. You see still bone marrow edema, but he had it before it's going down. But the cartilage reconstitution so far looks very good. Cartilage signal still a little heterogeneous, but this is normal at uh, three months. But you can see the great biologic potential of the chips already at uh, three months. And what I've seen so far, it is getting much better at six months and usually looks very good at 12 months and even better over a longer periods. And such maturation processes have actually been just published in the case of one patient who had a bi uh, bipolar, no, uh, right and left knee joint um, um, minced cartilage procedure at this uh, medial condyle plus osteotomy. Osteotomy is not absolutely perfect. Nevertheless, the cartilage uh, two or three years after the procedure looks really good on T2 mapping, no uh, drop of the signal, no drop in clinical performance. Uh, so you can see the biologic potential is uh, very clearly there. To sum up, a minced cartilage autocard procedure is not an expensive procedure. It is purely autologous, purely homologous. It is a one-step, one surgeon, one OR procedure. It is arthroscopically feasible in most cases, I would say. You have no substantial change of tissue for that. It is no ATMP, which is very important to my consideration. Uh, I currently use it for any so small and large. The smallest is below one square centimeter. My largest so far was 10 square centimeters. So I use it for any chondral as well as osteochondral lesion. And which I think is very important, you are using location specific PRP boosted fully differentiated cartilage, uh, which is very potent and has not been sitting in the lab and is tried transplanted um, directly. And I think because of that, it has a good position when comparing to concurring cartilage procedures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gian, for this uh, outstanding talk. And also, Christoph, for your very lovely talk. Uh, as you all see, uh, you could see that fragments is quite interesting way to treat cartilage uh, uh, repair, uh, to using repair procedures. And uh, we now have some time for discussion. Uh, I could start to ask, uh, uh, Gian, um, what is your rehab protocol? Because we have some question about the rehabilitation. Yeah, uh, thank you for the good question. Actually, uh, I'm here very conservative and stick to what you told me a couple of years ago. I do still the same rehabilitation as an ACI. So it is bed rest in an extension brace for 20, 24 hours. And after that, it is partial weight bearing for four to six weeks, depending on location. And uh, in tibiofemoral lesion, free range of motion early on. In patellofemoral lesion, I'm a little um, uh, reduced to that. And then uh, getting to full range of motion, full weight bearing during week seven, eight. That's my current rehabilitation protocol and full return to sport like soccer 12 months. It's still like that. Yeah, and I have a similar, I also put you know, uh, the, the patient in a brace locked in extension for two weeks and then I uh, um, unlock the brace and they have the brace just outdoors, not anymore indoors, and they are allowing weight bearing to the level of pain. 
so it's a little maybe more aggressive but similar uh, and then uh, Christoph uh, regarding the graph net uh, could you say you you could use your graph net collector for different uh, uh, shavers but what is your recommendation regarding millimeters to get the small size of the fragments? Which uh, shaver blade should you use? What is your opinion? Well, when we tested our shaver types, the best results we achieved with a shaver three millimeter. Uh, this is a good compromise uh, of time uh, <laughs> needed to harvest the chips and particle size and the standardization. When you use the graph nets for different tissues, uh, which is possible like bone, or even soft tissue, then you need to choose the appropriate shaver type. Mm. And which shaver are you using mostly, Gian? Um, I try to do everything with a 3.0 shaver, but sometimes it gets uh, um, a little stuck, but I think the 3.0 is perfect. And sometimes the, the little bigger pieces, which I debride from the defect edge, I take with a 3.8. So I debride good looking pieces I take with a 3.8 and the rest I do with a 3.0. And what about a dry joint? Uh, I mostly try to have some fluid in the joint, otherwise it collapses. But what is your uh, tips and tricks for, for doing it? Because if you have a fully dry joint, it could be a little difficult. Yeah. So um, you actually, if you want to perform it perfectly, you need a dry joint. And this is sometimes the most problematic of, of the whole procedure. So first uh, tourniquet applied 250, 280, uh, even 300. And then I'm a little more aggressive at the capsule, at the hoffer to have some space, uh, a lot of electrocoagulation, but not too much. And then I usually put a swap, I do a two or three portals at the lesion, I put a swap under the condyle and then I pull a little bit on the swap so you have some capsular dist distension so it is not collapsing when when stopping the water influx and if you do all that all that nicely uh, usually you get everything dry and if that's not enough I put a shaver on mild suction at the at this at the place where the water is coming from it is usually coming from somewhere down uh, to perform continuous suction and then usually it works uh, uh, nicely i had some experience with that by using uh, novocard inject aci for many years so it is just a matter of experience but then you get everything dry usually and christoph if you want to use allergenic fragments uh, uh, is it the biocartilage that you recommend or you, you have another solution as well? well? Absolutely. This is the preferred procedure done in the US when they combine the biocartilage with some uh, allergenic, uh, with the allergenic approach and then combine that with the autologist ships harvested by the graft net uh, device. And did you use it also, uh, Gian, uh, the allergenic? No, actually, I, I currently we don't have too, too good access to allergenic chondrocytes, so that's that's not a matter of fact. But I don't think there's a reason for that because when you are looking at cartilage defects and when you're debriding such, you usually have more than enough tissue to directly transplant. So why should you discard this very good tissue when you can actually transplant it? So I think you don't you don't require it. Okay. I got here a comment from Hayo Terman saying drying the joint is much easier in the ankle and subtalar joint. So certainly that's also an area where you could use this technology. Uh, and um, Christoph, do you have any reports of use in, in the hip joint? Yeah, we are, we are now expanding into several joints. We started obviously in the knee, but then expanded into the foot and ankle surgery. Also now people start to use it in the hip. And also we have, uh, well, it's now several uses, starting with the shoulder, uh, which is a bit more complicated for drying the joint, but uh, with good initial results. So more joints uh, with the same uh, procedure. Okay. Uh, uh, can, can, I, can I ask a question to both of you? Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the regeneration potential of the cartilage particulate, would you consider uh, an additional microfracture in these procedures? Well, for, for me, if, if the subchondral bone is intact, I would leave it uh, um, because certainly then, then you could induce a stiffness in the bone 
And as has been shown, you don't need to have this additional bone marrow cells, but we heard about the technology where you mix one stage uh, chondrocytes with bone marrow cells, uh, like aspiration from the iliac crest. So maybe you could do an, an, uh, an aspiration from the iliac crest, but I'm not sure that you would need it. If you are going to do a bone repair at the same time, you have an osteochondral defect, then you may think about opening the space to have bone marrow cells coming in and combine it with the fragment. That's my, my idea. And what's your skin? I think if you have a healthy subchondral bone, you should not violate it. There's absolutely no reason. And the fraction of stem cells at the, at the bone marrow cavity is usually very low. So I don't see any reason for that. If you have a bone marrow edema, which you want to decompress at the same time, maybe one drilling is okay, but, but not more. And you can even do that in a retrograde fashion. So I absolutely see no reason for that. And uh, you can attract stem cells from, if you want that, from somewhere else. You can get it from the iliac crest. You can get it actually from the notch. You can get it from the synovia, from the hoffa. You can get stem cells everywhere. But I would not violate the subchondral bone plate for that. And in my hands, I see a lot of interlesional osteophytes when you're, when you're violating the subchondral uh, uh, bone uh, plate. So uh, actually, I don't see a reason for that. If I have a bony defect, it is really suggested to perform a regular cancellous bone plasty and there it is suggested to drill into the bone to have some bleeding but for the bone not for the cartilage so i'm absolutely online with mats here and then we have a question from john herman cooper is uh, if you shave the defect ages do you normally get enough particles by simply shaving down to help the cartilage or do you need to remove more especially for large defects what is your comment here um if you have if you need more cartilage then then you get um so um in that cases if i know i i need a, uh, i need a lot of cartilage i take a very close look at the defect itself and if there are good looking pieces but usually you have in the, in the defect some sites where the cartilage is okay i take that for transplantation and discard what is not good looking and then i'm a little more aggressive um, at the defect edge. So if you, for example, have a six square centimeter defect, I enlarge it slightly to a 6.2, 6.3, or even 6.5. And then you usually gather more than enough cartilage for transplantation. If that not is if that is not enough, you can still gather cartilage from the notch where you take your biopsy for ACI. And this is what you also can do. And furthermore, you don't have to fill up the lesion to 100%. So in that case, if you go, it is suggested to go lower anyhow. So you fill it up to 70 to 80% to prevent delamination. And it's going to grow up after six to eight weeks. But if you have very large lesions and don't have enough cartilage, I think it is reasonable to fill it up just to 50% because you will transplant a lot because every, every chip that has a um, length, length of one by one by one millimeter has approximately eight to 10,000 uh, 10, chondrocytes. You, you transplant a lot and then you just fill it up to approximately 50% and you're just fine. It's going to grow up. You don't need uh, 20 million chondrocytes. No, and I agree. Uh, I normally also take from, from the lesion if it's good quality surrounding cartilage. Otherwise, I would add, which I normally take for chondrocyte implantation from uh, the uh, from the notches. We also have a comment from uh, 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 Vladimir Bobic, and he writes that most knees have some marginal tibial and femoral osteophytes, including the femoral notch, and they have done histology of those, uh, especially in ACL deficient knees, and there is a good hyaline cartilage there. So that could be an adequate source of cartilage, maybe. Um. Thank you, Vladimir. I also admire your work. Um, I think that is reasonable. Um, I would, in my hands, I would not dare to do that actually, but but I think it, it works. The the general problem in the, in that approach, I see if you see a, a osteophytes, the joint is a little arthritic uh, already, and the biologic response will not be absolutely perfect. So um, that's my only only comment on that. But generally, I think it works.
Yeah, it might be as uh, Vladimir writes here, it's an ACL deficient knee, so it could also be the instability that produces the osteophytes, and then maybe you could consider to use it if you have a large defect to fill up and so on. Uh, then you also have some bone marrow cells below in the osteophyte that could be a, a boosting effect, maybe. And Christoph, do you have any comments? No, I, that, that's fine. I think what, what Gian said, uh, using uh, the cartilage for just filling uh, about 50% in larger lesions is, is sufficient. Given our experience now with, I would say, north of 3,000 cases, uh, the, the, the lesions are filled within six to eight weeks anyway. Yeah, that's, I think that's important comment because it's important to know that you don't need to fill it up fully. Uh, and in some instances, I have been using the membrane in that instance because then you could have immigration of cells into the membrane that could be part of the filling in the top layers, especially if you have large and little deep defects that could be, uh, in my view, uh, a possibility as I'm using high F and we have so good uh, experience with high, high F for our chondrocyte implantation, the, the cells really likes to, to get it in, get into it. And the studies that was done by Sebastian Concaro, we used high F11, and we also used uh, um, another stimulation to get the cells to grow out into this area. So, so we know that it functions also with the membrane of that type, but it depends what type of membrane you have. If you have a membrane like a collagen membrane, the cells, will not be able to uh, migrate into it. But with the porous membrane, it's easier for the cells to, to repopulate it around. So we'll have another question. Uh, that was just a comment, okay. So any more ideas from you, Gian? In the final lines, we don't see any more questions now, so. There was a, there's a question from, from Hajo Terman, I answered, but uh, he asked if I'm using, or if I'm using an unloader brace. I, I use an unloader brace as a brace test before an osteotomy, but after the operation, I usually correct um, the virus or virus deformity by operation anyhow, so I don't need an unloader brace anymore. But if I have a straight aligned knee joint or one or one degrees degree of virus or valgus and if i see a bone marrow edema on top sometimes they use an unloader brace but this is very specific uh, indications and not in my uh, usually protocol yes uh, i do the same i'm using an unloaded brace sometimes when i don't consider it worthwhile to do and real osteotomy, but the patient have a slight malalignment and the defect is large. And also if there is no malalignment and if the defect is large, I could consider to use a, an unloaded brace after the two first weeks. The two weeks week, the two the first weeks are locked in extension. Then I could open it up and put it in to valgus or virus depending on, on the leasing area. Any more questions? I don't see any more questions. And have we any final comment from you, uh, Christoph? Regarding? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. That's cool. And Gian? Say hi to Sebastian from my side. Yeah. Okay, so I thank you all for uh, uh, participating and listening to, to our talks. And I hope these uh, uh, talks will stimulate you for, for new uh, areas of cartilage repair. And the fragments are there uh, for you and easy uh, to, to reach. So uh, I think you should test it for the future. And I wish uh, that we could all meet in reality quite soon somewhere. And we will finally, we have a, a final slide for you because the next uh, webinar will be in September and it will be a presentation by Tom Minas and Kenneth uh, Seslow uh, giving you idea about uh, all different types of cases uh, and ventures in joint preservation. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you all for participating and look forward to see you all again.
Uh, bye bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Take care, everybody.